So I'm going to do my best with the names. Some of these names are not names I'm super familiar with, but I'll do my best and you can hear me struggle along just like maybe you would if you were reading this yourself. So diary of a young girl, Anne Frank, forward. Anne Frank kept a diary from June 12, 1942 to August 1st, 1944. Initially, she wrote strictly for herself. Then one day in 1944, Garrett Olkenstein, a member of the Dutch government in exile, announced in a radio broadcast uh, from Fonden that after the war, he hoped to collect eyewitnesses' account of the suffering of the Dutch people under German occupation, which could be made available to the public. As an example, he specifically mentioned letters and diaries. Impressed by this speech, Anne Frank decided that she decided that when the war was over, she would purchase a book based on her diary, publish a book based on her diary. She began rewriting and editing her diary, improving the text, omitting passages she didn't think were interesting enough, and adding others from memory. At the same time, she kept up her original diary in the scholarly work, The Diary of Anne Frank, The Critical Edition. Anne's first unedited diary is referred to as version A to distinguish it from a second edited diary, which is known as version B. The last diary entry in Anne's, the last entry in Anne's diary is dated August 1st, 1944. On August 4th, 1944, the eight people hiding in the secret annex were arrested. Miep Giles and Bep Volsvoluski, the two secretaries working in the building, found Anne's diary strewn all over the floor. Mep Giles tucked them away in a desk drawer for safekeeping. After the war, when it became clear that Anne was dead, she gave the diaries unread to Anne's father, Otto Frank. After long deliberation, Otto Frank decided to fulfill his daughter's wish and publish her diary. He selected materials from version A and B, editing them into a shorter version later referenced as version C. Readers all over the world know this as the diary of a young girl. In making his choice, Otto Frank had to bear several points in mind. To begin with, the book had to be kept short so it would fit in with a series put out by the Dutch publisher. In addition, several passages dealing with Anne's sexuality were omitted. At the time of the diary's initial publication in 1947, it was not customary to write openly about sex and certainly not in books for young adults. Out of respect for the dead, Otto Frank also omitted a number of unflattering passages about his wife and the other residents of the secret annex. Anne Frank, who was 13 when she began her diary and 15 when she was forced to stop, wrote without reserve about her likes and dislikes. When Otto Frank died in 1980, he willed his daughter's manuscripts to the Netherlands State Institute for War Documentation in Amsterdam. Because the authenticity of the diary had been challenged ever since its publication, the Institute of War Documentation ordered a thorough investigation once the diary, thorough investigation, once the diary was proven beyond a shadow of a doubt to be genuine, it was published in its entirety, along with the results of an exhaustive study. The critical edition contains not only versions A, but C, and also articles on the background of the Frank family and circumstances surrounding their arrest and deportation, and the examination into Anne's handwriting, the documents, and the materials used. The Anne Frank Foundation, or Anne Frank Fonds, in Switzerland, which, as Otto Frank's sole heir, had also inherited his daughter's copyrights, then decided to have a new expanded edition of the diary published for general readers. This new edition is no way is in no way affects the integrity of the old one originally edited by Otto Frank, which the diary and its message to millions of people. The task of computing the expanded edition was given to the writer and translator Miriam Pressler. Otto Frank's original selection has now been supplemented with passages from Anne's A and B versions. Miriam Pressler's definitive edition, approved by Anne Frank Fons, contains approximately 30% more material as it intended to give the reader more insight into the world of Anne Frank. In writing her second version, B, Anne invented pseudonyms for the people who would appear in the book. She initially called herself Aunt Isles and later Anne Robin. Otto Frank opted to call his family by their own names and to follow Anne's wishes with regards to the others. Over the years, the identity of the people who helped the family in the secret annex had become common knowledge. 
In this edition, the helpers are now referred to by their real names as they so justly deserve to be. All other persons are named in accordance with the pseudonyms in the critical edition. The Institutes for War Documentation has arbitrarily assigned initials to those persons wishing to remain anonymous. The real names of the people hiding in the secret annex are the Van Pels family from Germany, August Van Pels, Hermann Van Pels, and Peter Van Pels, called by Anne in her transcript, uh, Petrolia, Hans, and Alfred Van Don, and the book uh, Petronolia, Hermann, and Peter Van Dan. Fritz Pfeiffer, called by Anne in her manuscript, Alfred Duzel. The reader may wish to bear in mind that much of this edition is based on B version of Anne's diary, which she wrote while she was around 15 years old. Occasionally, Anne went back and commented on passages she had written earlier. Those comments are clearly marked in this edition. Naturally, Anne's spelling and linguistic errors have been corrected. Otherwise, the text has basically been left as she wrote it, since any attempt at editing and clarification would be inappropriate in a historical document. I hope I will be able to confide everything to you, as I have never been able to confide in anyone, and I hope you will be a great source of comfort and support. Okay. June 12, 1942. I hope I will be able to confide everything to you, as I have never been able to confide in anyone, and I hope you will be a great source of comfort and support. Comment added by Anne on September 28, 1942. So far, you truly have been a great source of comfort to me, and so is Kitty, whom I now write to regularly. This way of keeping a diary is much nicer, and now I can hardly wait for these moments when I am able to write in you. Oh, I'm so glad I brought you along. So Kitty refers to, uh, I guess, kind of an imaginary friend, I guess is the way we would look at it. Sunday, June 14, 1942. From the moment I got you, you being the diary, the moment I saw you lying on the table among my other birthday presidents, I went along when you were bought, but that doesn't count. On Friday, June 12th, I was awakened at 6 o'clock, which isn't surprising since it was my birthday, but I am not allowed to get up at that hour, so I had to control my curiosity until quarter to 7. When I couldn't wait any longer, I went to the dining room where uh, Morchi, the cat, welcomed me by rubbing against my legs. A little after seven, I went to Daddy and Mama, and then to the living room to open my presents, and you were the first thing I saw, maybe one of my nicest presents. Then a bouquet of roses, some pe uh, peonies, and potted plant. From Daddy and Mommy, I got a blue blouse, a game, a bottle of grape juice, which my, to my mind tastes a bit like wine, after all wine is made from grapes, a puzzle, a jar of cold cream, 2.5 guilders, which is money, and a gift certificate for two books. I got another book as well, a camera obscura, but Margaret already got it, so I exchanged mine for something else. A platter of homemade cookies, which I made myself, of course, since I'd become quite an expert at baking cookies. Lots of candy and a strawberry tart from Mother. And a letter from Grammy, right on time, but of course, that was just coincidence. Then Hana Lee came to pick me up, and we went to school. During recess, I passed out cookies to my teachers and my class, and then it was time to get back to work. I didn't arrive home until 5 since I went to the gym to gym with the rest of class. I'm not allowed to take part because my shoulders and hips tend to get dislocated. As it was my birthday, I got to decide which game my classmates would play, and I chose volleyball. Afterward, they all danced around me in a circle and sang, Happy Birthday. When I got home, Sansei uh, Fetterman was already there. Uh, Elise Wagner, Haniel... Hanalil Glozer and Jacqueline Van Morris came home with me after gym since we were in the same class. Hanali and Sane used to be my two best friends. People who saw us together used to say, there goes Anne, Hanali, and Sane. I only met Jack, uh, Jacqueline Van Morris when I started at the Jewish Lyceum, and now she's my best friend. Elise is Hanali's best friend, and Sane goes, Sane goes to another school and has friends there. They gave me a beautiful book, Judge Shashas and Legends, but they also gave me Volume 2 by mistake, so I exchanged two other books for Volume 1. Aunt uh, Helena, 
Helene brought me a puzzle, Aunt Stephanie a darling brooch, and Aunt Denzi a terrific book, Daisy Goes to the Mountains. This morning I lay in the bathtub thinking how wonderful it would be if I had a dog like Rin Tin Tin. I call him Rin Tin Tin 2, and I take him to school with me, where he could stay in the janitor's room or by the bike racks when the weather was good. Monday, June 15th, 1942. I had my birthday party on Sunday afternoon. The Rin Tin Tin movie was a big hit with my classmates. I got two brooches, a bookmark, and two books. I'll start by saying a few things about my school and my class, beginning with the students. Uh, Betty uh, Blomandiel looks kind of poor, and I think she probably is. She lives on some obscure street in West Amsterdam, and none of us know where it is. She does very well at school, but that's because she works so hard, not because she's smart. She's quite, she's pretty quiet. Jacqueline Van Marsen is supposed to be my best friend, but I've never had a real friend. At first I thought Jack would be one. I was badly mistaken. DQ initials have been assigned at random to those people who ref prefer to remain anonymous is a very nervous girl who always forgetting things. So her teachers keeps assigning her extra homework as punishment. She's very kind, especially to GZ. ES talks so much it isn't funny. She's always touching your hair or fiddling with your buttons when she asks you something. They say she can't stand me, but I don't care since I don't like her very much. Henry Metz, Henny Metz is a nice girl with a cheerful disposition, except she talks in a loud voice and is really childish when we're playing outdoors. Unfortunately, Henny has a girlfriend named Beppy, who's a bad influence on her because she's dirty, dirty and vulgar. JR, I could write a whole book about her. J is detestable, sneaky, stuck-up, two-faced gossip who thinks she's she's so grown up. She really got to j uh, Jack under her spell, and that's a shame. J is easily offended, bursts into tears at the slightest thing, and to top it off is a terrible show-off. Miss J always has to be right. She's very rich and has a closet full of the most adorable dresses that are way too old for her. She thinks she's gorgeous, but she's not. J and I can't stand each other. Yus uh, Wagner is a nice girl with a cheerful disposition, but she's extremely finicky and can spend hours moaning and groaning about something. Elise likes me a lot. She's very smart, but lazy. Hanel Goslar, or Lies, as she's being called at school, is a bit on the strange side. She's usually shy, outspoken at home, but reserved around other people. She blabs whenever you tell her. She blabs whatever you tell her to her mother. But she thinks what she says, and lately I've come to appreciate the, her a great deal. Uh, Nani Van Prag Cigar, C Cigar is small, funny, and sensible. I think she's nice. She's pretty smart. She's pretty smart. There's much else you could say about Nani. Alif Dejon is, in my opinion, terrific. Though she's only 12, she's quite a lady. She acts as if I were a baby. She's also very helpful and I like her. GZ is the prettiest girl in our class. She has a nice face, but is kind of dumb. I think they're going to hold her back a year, but of course I haven't told her that. Comment added by Anne at a later date. To my great surprise, GZ wasn't held back a year after all. And sitting next to GZ is the last of us 12 girls, me. There is a lot to be said about the boys, or maybe not so much after all. Maurice Costner is one of my many admirers, but pretty much of a pest. Sally Springer has a filthy mind, and rumor has it that, she's, that he's gone all the way. Still, I think he's terrific because he's very funny. Emil Bonewit is GZ's admirer, but she doesn't care. He's pretty boring. Rob Cohen used to be in love with me too, but I can't stand him anymore. He, he's an obnoxious, two-faced, lying, sniveling little goof who has an awfully high opinion of himself. Max Van De Weld is a farm boy from uh, <laughs> Mendeblick, but is sense, eminently sense suitable, as Margot would say. Herman Koopman also has a filthy mind, just like Jopi De Beer, who's a terrible flirt and, abs and absolutely girl crazy. Leo Blom is Jopi De Beer's best friend, but has been ruined by his dirty mind. Albert D. Mesquita came from the Montessori school and skipped a grade. He's really smart. Leo, Leo Slager came from the same school, but isn't as smart. Rue Stoppelman is a short, goofy boy from Alimo who transferred to this school in the middle of the year. CN does whatever he's not supposed to. Uh, Jock Kudernit sits behind us next to C, and we, G and I, laugh ourselves silly. 
Harry Shop is the most decent boy in our class. He's nice. Werner Joseph is nice too, but all the changes taking place lately have made him too quiet. He seems really, he seems boring. Sam Salomon is one of those tough guys from across the tracks, a real brat, admirer. Appy Ream is pretty orthodox, but a brat too. Writing in a diary, so this is Saturday, June 20th, 1942. Writing in a diary is a really strange experience for someone like me, not only because I've never written anything before, but also because it seems to me that later on, neither I nor anyone else will be interested in the musings of a 13-year-old schoolgirl. Oh well, it doesn't matter. I feel like writing, and I have an even greater need to get all kinds of things off my chest. Paper has more patience than people. I thought of saying on one of those days when I was feeling a little depressed and when sitting at home with my chin in my hands, bored and listless, wondering whether to go to stay or to in or to go out. I finally stayed where I was brooding. Yes, paper does have more patience. And since I'm not planning to let anyone else read this stiff back note notebook, grandly referred to as my diary, unless I should ever find a real friend, it probably won't make much of a difference. Now I'm back to that point that prompted me to keep a diary in the first place. I don't have a friend. Let me put it more clearly, since no one will believe that a 13-year-old girl is completely alone in the world. And I'm not. I have loving parents and a 16-year-old sister, and there are about 30 people I can call friends. I have a throng of admirers who can't keep their adoring eyes off me, and who sometimes have to result to using a broken pocket mirror to try to catch a glimpse of me in the classroom. I have a family, loving aunts, and a good home. No, on the surface I seem to have everything except one, one true friend. All I think about when I'm with friends is having a good time. I can't bring myself to talk about anything but ordinary everyday things. We don't seem to be able to get any closer and that's the problem. Maybe it's my fault we don't confide in each other. In any case, that's just how things are and unfortunately they're not liable to change. This is why I've started the diary. To enhance the image of this long-awaited friend in my imagination, I don't want to jot down any of the facts in the diary the way most people would do, but I want the diary to be my friend, and I'm going to call my friend Kitty. Since no one would understand a word of my stories to Kitty if I were to plunge right in, I'd better provide a brief sketch of my life as much as I dislike doing. My father, the most adorable man I've ever seen, didn't marry my mother until he was 36 and she was 25. My sister Margot was born in Frankfurt, and Frankfurt, AM Maine, in Germany in 1926. I was born on June uh, 12th, 1929. I lived in Frankfurt until I was four. Because we're Jewish, my father immigrated to Holland in 1933 when he became the managing director of the Dutch Operatic Company, which manufactures products used in making jam. My mother, uh, Edith Hollander Frank, went with him to Holland in September while Margot and I were sent to uh, Ashan to stay with our grandmother. Margot went to Holland in December. I followed in February when I was plunked down on the table as a birthday present for Margot. I started right away at the Montessori Nursery School. I stayed there until I was six, at which time I started first grade. In sixth grade, my teachers was Mrs. Cooperus, the principal. Teacher was Mrs. Cooperus, the principal. By the end of the year, we were both in tears as we said a heartbreaking farewell because I had to be accepted at the Jewish Lyceum where Margot also went to school. Our lives were not without anxiety, since our relatives in Germany were suffering under Hitler's anti-Jewish laws. After the pogroms, pogrom is a fancy word for really bad mistreatment of Jewish people, including murder in some cases. After the pogroms in, the 19, in 1938, my two uncles, my, brothers, my mother's brothers, fled Germany, finding safe refuge in North America. My elderly grandmother came to live with us. She was 73 years old at the time. After May 1940, the good times were few and far between. First there was the war, then the capitulation, and then the arrival of the Germans, which is when the trouble started for the Jews. Our freedom was severely restricted by a series of anti-Jewish decrees. Jews were required to wear a yellow star. Jews were required to turn in their bicycles. Jews were forbidden to use streetcars. Jews were forbidden to ride in cars, even their own. Jews were required to do their shopping between 3 and 5 p.m. Jews were required to frequent only Jewish-owned barbershops and beauty parlors. Jews were forbidden to be out in the streets between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. Jews were forbidden to attend theaters, movies, or any form of entertainment. 
Jews were forbidden to use swimming pools, tennis courts, hockey fields, or any other athletic fields. Jews were forced were forbidden to go ruin, rowing. Jews were forbidden to take um, to take part in any athletic activity in public. Jews were forbidden to sit in the gardens or those of their friends after 8 p.m. Jews were forbidden to visit Christians in their home. Jews were required to attend Jewish schools, etc. You couldn't do this, you couldn't do that, but life went on. Jack always said to me, I don't dare do anything more because I'm afraid it's not allowed. In the summer of 1941, Grandma got sick and had to have an operation so much, so my birthday passed with little celebration. In the summer of 1940, we didn't do much for my birthday either since the fighting had just ended in Holland. Grandma died in January 1942. No one knows how often I think of her and still love her. This birthday celebration in 1942 was intended to make up for the others, and Grandma's candle was lit along with the rest. The four of us are still doing well, and that brings me to the present date of June 20, 1942, and the solemn dedication of my diary. Okay, and that will end part two.